thank you also to the three speakers. And now it's time to move to the first roundtable of the final conference. So this roundtable is about uh, sub-seasonal forecasting of extreme for and with end users. So I would like to hand with our four panelists. So we have Alejandro Marti from Mitiga Solution, a company specialized in risk management. Uh, Mario de la Fuente from the wine technical platform PTV. It's a non profit association in the wine sector. Jan Eichner from Munich Re, a major actor of uh, reinsurance. And Albert Sore from the Barcelona Supercomputing uh, Center. Yes, just to introduce the, the run table. So, uh, the aim of this roundtable is to gate uh, the point of view of representatives of end users regarding the, the results and product and products that have been developed during CAFE, uh, how they, they can be used, do they match to real needs, what are the prerequisites to include this kind of information in the business and operation. Uh, we will also talk about the role of intermediaries in the um, climate services value chain and about co-design and what are the good practices to design relevant products for end users. Before starting the discussion, I propose to have a short presentation of our four panelists. And Jan, please, you can start. Okay, thank you. So, um... Yeah, it's working. Uh, the first slide, well, I'll bore you with, with three slides of text, but I'll, I'll be fast. Um, the first slide is just some background, what insurance means and reinsurance. Some people might not really know what that is about, but it's actually simple. So first we have a sedan who buys a cover. I mean, every one of us is doing this with car insurance, with health insurance, et cetera, when you insure your home. And of course we agree on a limited amount of a payout and it's covered for a certain period, not for infinity or the rest of the life. And uh, we buy this from an insurance company. Now, what is the insurance company doing with that? Oh, sorry, it was the wrong direction. They're actually buying a cover as well from a reinsurance company. And there are two, mainly two types of covers, how you can do that. You can either participate per loss event, or you can pay on an annual aggregated basis over many, many events that appear over a year, that occur over a year. Now, what does the reinsurance company do with that? Oh, sorry. First, let me let me say, if you do this peer loss or per loss event cover, it's either proportional to a loss. So, if the loss is small, the reinsurance company also only pays a small share of it, or one agrees to a threshold, and then the reinsurance company pays all the rest once it is above a threshold. Now, but what is the reinsurance company doing with these with these aggregated losses or with these aggregated covers and risks? Well, the Business of a reinsurance company is usually a global business. That means we can hedge our, ex our extremes or the extreme events and uh, over the whole globe. And that, that helps us to create uncorrelated risks, which is essentially the core point of hedging risks to make them uncorrelated. And uh, yeah, so by this, we are doing a spatial decorrelation. Now, uh, the cover period itself also helps us. Uh, typically, cover periods are one year. Why is that the case? Well, uh, because uh, seasonality can disturb us. Seasonality creates spatial correlations, uh, sorry, temporal correlations, and we have to get rid of them as well. Why do we should we get rid of them? Because there is this challenge of pricing. You need to price an insurance product. And pricing, to make it easier for us, because we are not, not all of us are scientific experts, uh, we usually add and multiply and dive, divide numbers, that's about it. But um, we, uh, we are working with annual expected losses, which are just long-term means. And we are maybe working also with some standard deviations to account for some amount of variability that is in these types of uh, data that we use for pricing. But the main point is we always assume stationarity and we can only assume this once we got rid of the seasonality. And this is why we are so keen or focused on products that last at least for long, one year or longer. It doesn't make sense to have products that even go longer than say five years or so, because then we, we are facing other issues like El Nino, La Minha, stuff like that. 
or warm phases, cold phases. Now, so much for the background. How do we use forecast and predictions in reinsurance business when I say, hey, we are only interested in long-term means? Well, there are still some uh, mechanisms, but let me first, sorry, let me first say um, also, they are, they are focusing now on two types of insurance sectors, I should say. The one is the NATCAT business, and the other is, because it's similar in terms of the mathematics that is applied, is the agricultural and the energy business. In the agriculture and energy business, we are looking at long-term deviations from typical seasonality. So a season is too dry, too wet, too hot, too cold, et cetera. Yeah? or too much wind, too little wind. And that creates a loss for a company and you can sure against that. So we're always summing up of little increments of little anom anomalies around a typical seasonality about the seasonal average. And that creates an index and that is used for insurance. If there is a single extreme among these hundred days or so we are aggregating about, uh, over, doesn't matter. It will be sort of minimized through averaging, stabilized to the law of large numbers. And then there are the other products, the nut cut products. This is where we really look for these uh, yeah, shock-like extreme events, these single peaks, these single spikes for which we need to extrapolate maybe in the unforeseen range of events, we might have to apply extreme value statistics. Examples would be earthquakes, storms, floods. I mean, we all know this from the news. And uh, so what can we do? Now, let's assume for a second, we have a, we have a, perfect, a perfect reliable forecast for the next, for the next season, yeah? Um, what do we do with that? What would we do with that? First of all, we would fear to miss our economic target because we will have to pay. And uh, that means, as a consequence, the stocks will go down. This keeps our higher management, uh, gives our higher management sleepless nights. And we don't want that because that in turn would create pressure on us on the bottom again in the hierarchy. And so we have to do something about this. And what can be done is there are some risk management options to do. And uh, depending on what, what of these options that are listed here are, are chosen, that depends pretty much on the time scale between an issuing, an issued forecast or when the forecast was issued and the fork and the and when the event is supposed to take place, what's the time scale, time span between? And the typical four, four ways of of what you can still do if you're already you know, tied in that problem uh, is you can either increase policy prices. It's not very nice for the sedans. You can uh, maybe reduce your so-called risk appetite. That means you are not offering certain insurance or reinsurance products in these areas anymore for a limited time. And uh, that's a third one would be to buy reinsurance as a reinsurance company, they can also do this, or something which is called retrocession, which is sort of similar. And the fourth option is, and that's pretty expensive, to buy more risk capital. Uh, so th this would mean we have to use our silverware, basically, and, and, and buy money for, for that. And uh, now uh, some food for thought. So there is this fundamental principle of, of insurability, and this is unpredictability. We are ensuring unpredictable events. And yeah, what happens if this principle is violated, if we now suddenly achieve pretty reliable predictions? Um, I would say depending on the nature and quality of a forecast, some insurance products might become uneconomical and obsolete. Yeah? You, it's, you cannot insure yourself, yourself against the hurricane if you know exactly the date and time when it will come. Yeah, it's not possible, or an earthquake. Um, it might, uh, some insurance products might require delayed inception days so that the actual cover period starts long after the prediction horizon, the prediction time scale. So we are again back into our random noise process and not in a, in, in a solid forecast process anymore. Or um, uh, the insurance product might need to be really, uh, replaced by new types of products that have a total new, new focus that are not focusing on ensuring the actual loss or the indemnity, but rather uh, provide incentives to, for, for prevention matter, measures to avoid such big losses to occur, to give the people money that they can reinforce their, house, their houses, their homes, or make sure that the car isn't standing out on the street when the hailstorm is coming, stuff like that. Yeah. Or... Uh, Fourth type, I mean, this is all very speculative, what I'm writing. This is all very speculative. Um, or we can even maybe yeah, replace <laughs> uh, certain types of insurance product by products that rather 
try to ensure the reliability of the forecast that is made. Because once the forecast is made, decisions are made. And this again comes with the risk that the decision that was made was a wrong decision. And it can come with costs and come with a, also a loss. A loss. And so maybe the, the, the forecast range, the forecast range or the forecasted event itself can be ensured not in terms of the intensity that it has, but in terms of what did it trigger that someone issued a forecast, what types of losses or problems or costs. And that's already it uh, from my side. So with these questions, I will hand over. Thank you. I, can, I don't know if it's you, Mario, or... Yes, we to have the presentation, but perhaps Albert, you can, uh, as you want. So, um, he hello to everyone. Uh, so I already presented this morning uh, our work, so I will be really short without uh, showing any slide. So at BSC, um, beyond doing basic research on climate and air quality, we also do applied research. So taking into account specific needs from energy, agriculture, or also insurance, we try to, yeah, to improve uh, our methods uh, to provide a uh, useful information. So, and my role here in this, uh, in this table, it's, it's a bit, uh, I'm a bit, so they are more from a specific, uh, they are like final users. I am, I'm so how more in, in the middle between the research community and the final users. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Uh... <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Celine, for inviting me. This is a pleasure to be here. I'm so sorry, but I'm not a meteorologist nor climatologist, no forecasting model expert or something like that. I only an expert in viticulture. So I feel so sorry for being here today. But I'm representing the wine sector. The wine sector is taking account that uh, this one of the first into agricultural sector, uh, very and really worried about the climate change effect. Why? Because the wine is produced in one determinate region. So it means that it's depending on the territory, the climate and the concrete region. So it's not, sorry, we are not the beer, we are not the wheat. So it's linked to the territory tradition and other things and other factors. So today we are representing the Spanish uh, technology, wine technology platform. Let me show you four slides to present you this association. Our, our mission is, is a non-profit association trying to boost the R and D into the wine sector in general, not only in climate. We, we have six areas, six different areas for working. And one of them is climate change and sustainability matters. So it means that the climate change for us is important. Okay. Uh, this is a non-profit association built in two, 2011. So it means that this is a quite nice uh, trend in the time. And uh, our main goal is trying to boost R&G projects at national, regional, and European level, okay? Kind of consortium. Let me show you some numbers. Today, we are more than 200 associated. Of course, the university technological centers, uh, all the research is linked to the wine sector are inside the platform, but not only that, the companies also, wine producers, great growers, and uh, as if I might say that, like a stakeholders around the wine sector, it means also climate enterprises and, uh, and of course, all kind of uh, technology and uh, like drones and geese and fertilizers, whatever that you think around the wine sector are here. And uh, we try to promote uh, around the projects as I said before, the last year I promote uh, 54 projects uh, that means more than 80 millions of euros of fund publics demanded. Unfortunately, it's not all granted, but uh, finally more than 20 millions of euros are granted directly to the wine sector in, here in Spain through uh, 13 projects, okay? 
that's our numbers. Regarding climate change projects, and uh, because this is more or less the topic that we are talking la later, uh, we already have, uh, I, I think, a quite expertise about it from the big projects like Demeter uh, through European projects like Life Prior and Monsan project here, close to, to here in, uh, in the Deo Priorat and Monsan region. Okay. I put the names and you can. And you can see in the website. This slide try to summarize the effect for the climate and the and the weather that can uh, that can worry or worry a lot to, to the wine sector. The of course the average rise in temperature, increasing in the stream events like a summer high wet. Some of them we, uh, we saw. We saw during this morning and this afternoon, spring frost also worries about that. The hails, it's difficult to predict that. The strain rainfalls and the absence of rainfalls during the summer is a, a very, very important period for us during the world, world cycle. And the wildfires also it mentioned before here. But uh, I think that the most important thing is extended drought periods during the summer, as I said before. Uh, the vine is a, is a cultive for a summer cultive, fruit crop cultive, and we need water during the summer. And if it is not coming from the rain, we should have a variable during this period. So for us, the drought is a real warning. They can, I, I don't, I don't want to, to, to bore you about the, the effect about the plant physiology of, uh, effects and something like that. So I summarize in this, in this slide, but mainly you should be in mind that the gel heterogeneity, the quality of the berry is not the same when drought periods occur during the summer. This are uncomplacing the quality of polyphenols, anthocyanins, tannins, and of course, sugar content. And of course, we think that we have we will have a problem with the water availability management here in this country, in the Spanish situation, but I think in general in Europe. But that's all, pretty much. So I'm available for your question here, and I'm happy to share with you during the round table. Thanks. Thank you, Mario. Now we have last presentation from Alejandro. Um, Thank you. Um, ¿Es un video lo que tienes que poner? No, no es una presentación. Right, well, let me introduce myself. My name is Alex Martí. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Mitiga. It's a pleasure to be here today and thank you for the invitation. I also sit as a chairman of the UN um, focus group for natural disasters, specialized on um, extreme weather. And let me start just by saying that five years ago, I was on those six. So I was a PhD student. I was a Marie Curie and I was doing my PhD in in natural disasters. So, I mean, five years later, I'm on the other side of the table, but every day I feel more like being on that side in any case. Um, just to tell you a bit about Mitiga, so um, I'm, I'm, we all know Albert very well. We are a spin off from the National Supercomputing Center. That's where we were born. So, a lot of what we are about is a transfer in science and technology from science to industry. We are, we like to call ourselves a science based insure tech. And basically, what we do is to predict and mitigate the impact of natural catastrophes. As Jan was mentioning before, the NATCAT is our sweet spot. Um, basically, we focus on secondary perils and perils that are induced or have an impact on climate. So I can go a little bit more in detail later on. In terms of what we offer um, in Mitiga is um, a hybrid approach between the typical probabilistic approach that uh, traditional insurance or risk modeling companies are providing together with physics based. So a lot of the numerical weather prediction that you guys are doing in your PhD is go into this basically to try to provide more or a better understanding of natural catastrophes and that is all about about um, 
being able to reduce that uncertainty that John was mentioning before and to help the insurance sector to price the risk better, to set the claims and, and the reserves in the best possible way. We also have an accountability for climate. So in our geophysical models, I always try to put um, the tendency of climate or at least to do what if scenarios with different IPCC report um, and the IPCC scenarios to try to stress the models on the different climate scenarios. And then last but not least, we also um, transfer the risk to the capital markets through parametric um, solutions or ILS, uh, the typical CAD ponds. We focus on two types of hazards, basically um, weather, extreme weather and atmospheric hazards that will be hail, wind, extreme precipitation, droughts and the sort of likes and geophysical hazards. Um, wildfires and volcanoes are our main expertise. To build bottom up from that, so to build physics based solutions for the insurance sector, we use, of course, numerical weather predictions, dispersion models and geophysical models. A bit on, on our journey, and, and this hopefully I can inspire some of you on, on how we have made the jump from science to industry. We, of course, started with R&D. So a lot of H2020 projects in Mitiga, we have been almost 12 um, H2020 projects by now. So that helped us to finance the company, to start with that, to increase, um, increase and, and bring more PhDs and more um, scientists into the company. And then finally, to start providing commercial solutions to what we consider the clients of our clients. Um, so the clients of Jan's company, for example, which could be aviation stakeholders, the energy sector, infrastructure, logistics. For us, it was very important to understand why they insure, who they insure, and why the people who are buying insurance are buying insurance. So to that extent, we start selling commercial applications to those that manage the risk to ultimately go into um, who protects the risk, which is our target clients, which is the insurance sector. So in a way, we did this journey from R&D market fit, and then traction. And now we are at a point to scalability. I try to put this slide to give a little bit of, uh, and take this with a pinch of salt, because obviously this is a bit forced, but then in which projects or large disruptive projects that we are currently involved where seasonal forecasting is involved, and I'm saying a pinch of salt because sub-seasonal is a little bit tricky, no? but at least seasonal. So for example, with the European Commission, we're doing the first parametric solution for wildfire in Europe. You will see a lot of solutions in California, in the States, but for example, in Europe, wildfire is, is, is something that we are much behind. We did the first catastrophe bond um, for the humanitarian space together with the Red Cross um, based on volcanoes that it's global. It has um, 11 countries. We also work with the European Defense Agency on an AI project for weather and atmospheric hazards. And finally, I mean, this will be public in a couple of weeks. We've been um, contracted by Eurocontrol to do their, the next crisis management tool. So anything that happens in European airspace in terms of weather extremes, we'll be doing the modeling and the service on top of that. So this is to say that even though we already made the jump into the commercial um, applications, we're still very much involved into the agenda of, of pushing the state of the art forward. These are some of the clients that we actually work. Um, so um, don't worry, Jam Munich Re will be here soon. We're closing something on volcanoes. So hopefully we'll be there. But as you can see, and as I mentioned before, if you start bottom up, we start working with the clients of our clients and we scale up to work with our target clients. We also have an appreciation for the humanitarian space. We work with, uh, with natural catastrophes at the end of the day. So we have um, works done with the Danish Red Cross and, and UNDP in general. So that's all on my side. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Okay, now I propose to start the discussion with the uh, extreme. So today we talk a lot of subseasonal forecast of extreme, but I think that first we can start with extreme and then we will continue with subseasonal forecast. Each year seems worse than the year before in terms of extreme. This summer, for example, we experienced record in terms of temperature, doofed heat waves, leading to devastating wildfires. We can also talk about the late spring frost that impact a lot the agriculture sector of flooding, flooding caused by heavy precipitation, hail storm, etc. Um, all these events impact a lot uh, many sectors in the global economy in general. And being able to forecast or at least characterize this information can help to better prepare and adapt. 
My first question to the panelists would be to tell us more about which kind of information is important for your sector, your activity. Uh, what are your needs regarding extreme events and what um, about the information you have access to? Are you satisfied by this information? How it could be improved? And also I would like to have your uh, opinion about uncertainties and how you manage the question of uncertainties in your, in your business. Um, yes, so please, I, can we start with <laughs> Ma? Oh. Can you hear me? Okay, that's on, is it? Yeah. Um, I mean, of course, well, extreme events are our, our core business in the NetCat sector, of course. So if, if there, are, there are different aspects, I would say, that need to be considered. The one, of course, is if something changes on the occurrence probability of extreme events. If they are definitely changing over, I don't want to say long term, I'd rather say midterm. If we can say, okay, this changes now for the next five years. And this has implications on our pricing. The other thing is, but I think this is already pertaining to forecasts, so maybe I, I just mentioned this now and we speak about this probably then, then in a second, is uh, as I mentioned that uh, it's quite relevant for our, our reaction if, if we see something coming, uh, how precise is the forecast that we see coming? Because it, 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 it has an effect on how we react, on what kind of tools we can, we can start, we can initiate uh, basically um, to reduce the impact on our side. But the first point is uh, how do frequencies and maybe also intensities of extreme events change in the near future? With near future, I mean everything below 10 years. So maybe following up what, what you're saying, John, I, I think in terms of what we are missing, if we can now, no? Better now, yeah. So at least from the from the risk modeling side, um, it, there is consistency in the data, right? So I mean, if you try to do any sort of product that is global, the models are as good as the data that you feed them with. So something that we struggle with is to have that consistency of data, both from a geospatial point of view, but also from a temporal resolution. Obviously, the measurements on the ground that actually it's what it's giving you that um, size of the or that impact of the event. Um, it's not, not transversal. So um, for me, the, the consistency of the data input is the big challenge to have a global product. Okay, I, I, try, uh, I try to, to express myself during the, during the, the first presentation. Uh, for the wine sector, I think uh, the most important is in events, uh, apart from hails and apart from the spring flows that uh, they can Vary a lot the, the yield if it occurs during concrete period in the in spring in spring time. I think the most uh, the the challenge is the drought period during the summer, and of course try to manage the the increase of temperature during the cycle, who varies a lot the the accumulation of maturity of the berry and the on the on the growth of the plant. And uh, talking about the how to improve that because it's, it's different, it's totally different, try to, to predict. I'm talking about only for the, for the data ground in the, in the fields, okay? In order to, to be more precise or accurate or, or ameliorate the accurate in the, or for the, agro, the agroclimatical models, okay? I, I think that uh, we have to take care about the data in the field trials, uh, which be representative, real representative, for the for the model in agronomic uh, point of view, and uh, I fully agree with you that the consistency of the data and the temporary data in climate maybe is, is uh, the, the key point. But also the uh, this data taken from the for the fields, which are representative of the variation variable, the heterogeneity of the terroir. If I may say that, a concept very used in in agro, the terroir. And the representative of the, of course, of the of the vineyards. Okay. 
I think this is a this is a an already a long lasting challenge across many many business sectors that decisions are binary, but information comes in as a continuous distribution, and uh, so if you digest that continuous distribution or somehow into something that is a bit more bimodal, three modal, whatever, a bit something different than a continuous function. I think if that would be possible, this would already help a lot. Yeah. If if uh, if it's not up to the decision maker or the decision making units or the experts on from the decision making units to to interpret really the meaning of these distributions and where the uncertainties are, is the tail robust? Is the the peak, is this really a peak or is it maybe a bimodal peak, whatever? I mean, you can have all, all, all sorts of, of, of nastiness in these types of things. And, and because things are modeled, maybe they are just smooth because they are modeled. But in fact, they are actually much more volatile yeah, than, than what, what the outcome actually is. I think all these needs to be communicated, of course, in a digestible way. And that is, I think, really a big challenge for not only today, but probably for the last 20 years since computers have taken uh, their way into these types of sectors and businesses. We, yeah, we can have a question. Yeah. So um, just before question, uh, I, I would like also to discuss because for example, in the insurance sector, uh, you are often limited by the fact that there are not enough uh, input data from historical database. And how do you use uh, modeling to improve uh, what we don't have in the data. And because you are using modeling, so you have faced, uh, you have to tackle the uncertainties of modeling. And how can you manage this, that uh, in the insurance sector? Because it can impact, for example, uh, the, the prime definition and a lot of things in your business. Yeah. Yes. Answer again. Or I start to answer. So there are basically two approaches of how we how we deal with this with this type of challenge. The first one is, and this is the more broad one or more established one, even because it's the more reliable one, is we are pricing or calculating with so-called stochastic event sets. Someone smart, typically a company, not a single person, uh, has put a lot of computing power into creating large, large data sets covering th ten thousands of years of events under very different multiple different, let's say, climatic conditions, and we speak about storms, but similar for earthquakes. And uh, then they create a set of thousands, hundred thousands of events. And this has two advantages. First of all, by creating events, we always incorporate spatial correlations. We know the footprints of these events. And the second thing is by creating hundred thousands of events, we can be sure that our tails are sufficiently filled with numbers. And, and this, is, this is the main approach how risk modeling works in insurance. The second one is if you have products or requests, for instance, for extreme precipitation, we don't have these types of event sets. So our approach there is more or less what, what you do in science as well. You look at the reanalysis data at 40, 50, 60 years of data, as long as you can trust, as long as you have the data records. For satellite data, remote sensing data, it's maybe just 20 years. And then you have start to, to extrapolate. You have look into the class ball called extreme value statistics. And it, it works, it can work if you do it properly and carefully. It only has the problem that we are not creating these or incorporating automatically these spatial correlations because we are doing this more or less pixel by pixel or depending on the resolution on which the data is available. And that is still, I think, something that can be better. So just one last sentence. So the future that I see there is maybe the introduction of copulas, which are already there in the extreme value theory, applied on 
on the reanalysis data, on gridded data of maybe rainfall or other atmospheric parameters that are soil moisture, et cetera, to um, at least to some extent incorporate spatial correlations. Maybe picking up from this second point, and, and it's like a third approach, you know, it will be the use of AI to do transfer learning from, you know, data rich countries to data poor countries. We have done this with the United Nations recently for a hail product precisely where we use a data set from NOAA um, in the US to do, uh, an, well, build a model from bottom up in Georgia where they didn't have enough radars and soundings and hydromet stations and they wanted to have a hail and windstorm map. So we have used era five and reconstruct the event data set, creates the, the, the transfer learning tool to actually bring that data from, from one place to another. And that is a way to, to reconstruct. You know, obviously the stochastic analysis is what the industry has been using um, for many, many years. And, and we know the pros and cons. You know, I think it was actually Mini Grief who, who reported that you know, there is more than $5 trillion losses in the last 30 years you know, because of natural disasters. So the, the challenge is that um, the physics-based models right now, we can go, what, up to nine months, maybe, you know, seasonal forecasting and the insurance sector, like, doesn't like to go below that year. You know, there are some companies that are looking at seasonal parametric insurance, like Guy Carpenter in Wildfire, so they are willing to go that mark of one year a little bit down, but we still have that gap, right, from seasonal to year. Thank you. Um... I don't know if there is a question in the room, yeah, or no? Do you have a question here? Yeah. Perhaps we can open the discussion to the question. <laughs> Hi, it's a question for all of you. I don't know who would like to consider this point, but suppose you have a limited amount of money. What would you consider investing in as a priority for your own uh, business? So we, do you need more data? <laughs> do you need more computational resources? Uh, do you need more people, more qualified people? So what is it that if you had this money to invest, considering what's coming up, what do you think is best to get more data, more computers, more computer power? more human resources, more qualified? How little, how little is little money? <laughs> right, that's the answer, no? But um, people, it's always, you cannot build anything without right minds. People, for me, will be always the, the way to build up. Data be the second, and computational power is getting cheaper and cheaper. It's something that maybe five years ago, it was unaffordable. But now you have commercial clouds that you know, if you don't do all, if you do competition on demand, you know it's affordable. People, data, computational um, resources. If those three are the options for me, I agree with the sequence. <laughs> First of all, thank you. I have more questions and notes out of this panel discussion than I, I had a long time. So many, many questions, but in the interest of time, I just ask one. Well, first of all, I was pleased to hear so many references to ERA 5. That's very nice to hear. Now we are preparing, as I mentioned this morning, era six. So in a sense, my question, and you started addressing it already, is what would you like to see in era six? What different from what we have done so far should we start doing to help you better? I, I need 30 seconds to think about that, but good question. We can have also time over poster, yeah. coffee, or whatever. I think I have an idea, but that's very speculative, spontaneous idea. Um, when we get gridded atmospheric data um, that rarely reflects the actual risk that it's on the ground. So what we usually have to do is we have to 
overlay the data with, let's say, our exposure. But even that is um, sometimes a bit of a challenge because our exposure is on, you know, address resolution, and the atmospheric data or hazard data comes with a certain resolution, like ERA five data. Now, I think a big help would already be if that data would come with a suggestion of spatial aggregation. So it could be already, let's say, pre-overlaid with some, I call it land use, land cover data on high resolution. And it could be even scaled down in the first place. And then in the second place, aggregated on homogeneous blobs of, I don't know, areas, uh, watersheds, whatever is there. and so that, so that we don't have to do that anymore. And, and maybe that can already help uh, in, in, in maybe many other analysis as well, by not just looking at like a basin wide, I don't know, amount of huge data, but rather at segments that, that really belong together and reflect either maybe the same or belong together because of the same climatology or maybe totally other reasons because of the same orography below it or the same, whatever there is, whatever makes the data, whatever qualifies the data to be averaged, aggregated, or maximum selection, whatever you can come up with, how you can create one index that is representative for uh, some area. Yeah. So this, I think, would, would be very helpful because we are doing this and we are not knowing if we are doing this right. We have some experience with it, but we are just doing it how we think it might make sense, but it's maybe wrong. Well, I think from, I would definitely agree with, with Albert um, in terms of um, on the what, but if I can contribute on something on, from a logistical point of view, um, it's always very tedious to download the information and process, right? And when you do this in batches in largest amounts and you start working on a computational cloud that is commercial, this adds up in terms of pricing, no? Like, you know, like Geos5, they have put it in Amazon Cloud, for example and you can access to that. So something like, like that with the planetary computers of Microsoft or the Amazon um, cloud, it will really help because a lot of people is downloading and uploading this information from one cloud to another and paying every single time to the cloud provider. So agreements with the cloud providers for that information to be straight up there, it minimizes the cost of a public good, you know, which is something that I never realized until I left the BSC where you know, we had the time to download and the space to save it. But then when you need to go to a commercial cloud, something that you know should be a public good, it becomes expensive just for the fact that you need to load tons of information into the system. So this is something that, you know, probably more from a political point of view will be very helpful. This I think is a very important uh, answer again. Um, uh, ca can you stop these limitations of 120,000 data points that one can download on the ERA-5? Uh, download portal. If you just open that up, that would already be great. I needed an intern who repeats that job 40 times or 50 times in a row, a tedious work, to download the data basically year by year. And uh, I mean, of course, there are scripts, but if it's something that you need that's a bit outside of the available script, scripts, then it's tedious work. And just if the chunks could be 10 times bigger, would already be an enormous help. Okay, uh, I would like to move on now to the question of forecasting and I mean, seasonal forecasts. Um, until now, we can say that the information we have access to is quite limited with um, for short term forecast at four or five days uh, with a certain level of uncertainty depending of uh, the type of parameters we are interested in, the region and the climate and the atmospheric situation. We have also now the, um, the seasonal forecasts that start to be used, but for still limited application. Even if this morning we have information on that, yes, it, it starts to be more and more used. Um, and also for the seasonal forecast with the question of uncertainties and also how to communicate probabilistic uh, forecast. Um, first of all, I would like to know more uh, which kind of forecast uh, your activity sector is, is demanding, which kind of forecast we use, 
for, uh, for which objectives. Um, and if you are interested by subseasonal forecast, so we can we start to, to discuss this point, but if you can provide us more information, for example, Mario, if we can start with, uh, with the wine sector. Okay, yes, why not? Of course, the forecasting for us is, is, is relevant, uh, mostly regarding the, the warming alerts, mainly. In traditional here in agriculture, in, at national level, we, we had the national advisory uh, agencies you know, at regional level. Unfortunately for us, here in Catalonia, I think they still remain, like Catvid, but uh, in other regions in Spain, not. And uh, it, it was very useful to, to, to have the technician from the MAPA, from the Ministry of Agriculture, to, to advi give an advice about the warming for spring frost, for instance. Or, uh, I give you one clear example. Uh, the downy mildew is on disease that this is easily to model if uh, if you have taken account only the precipitation during the spring and the temperature, and you can give to the great growers the advice that the downy mildew in your region uh, mainly occurs with uh, certain accuracy, and uh, it was very useful. But today there is no a national network about that, and uh, in the past. Yes, with less resources, no computers, and only agronomic technicians. So I beg it for the recover these kind of tools. Perhaps Alejandro for the air traffic uh, sector yeah, from, you are from working on. The aviation sector, I think uh, the subseasonal forecast works very well, obviously, when they need to manage and and manage what will be the, the routes that they're going to do within the week. So it, it helps very much to know whether there is going to be extreme weather events or it's going to be a sandstorm or there's going to be a volcanic um, ash event. So from an operational point of view or for emergency management, if we go more into the humanitarian space, that scale works. Unfortunately, then when we go to the insurance sector, that, that starts being less and less relevant. You know? And then you need to push that temporal scale to at least one year because that's how they underwrite the premiums and there is no way around that. But then you can argue that, you know, they can use these for the reserves and, you know, the claims and, you know, some, some large insurance companies, they have these advisory like Simo from AXA, right? That they notify their, their clients if a hail event comes, so you just put the car in your parking lot so they don't have to pay for the broken windshield. But um, we would like to see that gap being closed with the insurance sector. And uh, do you think uh, subseasonal forecast could be used also for early warning system? Because it's a tool that we use more and more and develop in many, for example, developing countries also to help the population to better adapt. Do you think that subseasonal forecast can, could be interesting for this? Uh... Absolutely. For emergency response, that's definitely something that it works very well, from both from the humanitarian space and from emergency responders, right? Civil protection and national environmental agencies and, and so forth. So to that extent, um, absolutely. Um, the issue with early warning systems is very difficult to have appetite from the commercial or the industry, right? Mm -hmm. That's more government or humanitarian. Well, early is relative. Yeah. <laughs> so what is early? Um, but I think there is there is a very I think there is a good example um, example parallel where that makes a lot of that sense, and that is wildfire. Uh, to avoid wildfires to happen, you need to clean the shrubs and brushes out of the forest or whatever the section, the wildlife urban interface, or so is that you're that you're ensuring or well, that you're in, in charge of, and that that doesn't that that should not be done three three days before the wildfire. That should be done like rather three weeks to three months before the wildfire. So if you know that there, if you had a wet spring, because like the, the worst for wildfire is not necessarily the record breaking drought or record breaking uh, heat wave in the summer. It, it also requires fuel to be there. So actually rain drives wildfire. It sounds a bit silly, but that's how it is. Rain in the winter and spring makes the shrubs and brushes to grow. And then you have suddenly you need an average summer, an average uh, heat wave and, and you have lots of wildfires. So this is a task that needs to be done really, really in advance. And for this, I think this is, this is the, I think picture book case for example case for uh, where seasonal forecast makes a lot of sense. 
a lot of sense. Um, and uh, also a question about, um, because you told us that in fact, uh, many end users could be interested by, by this uh, subseasonal forecast. But uh, my question is, are they ready to use it really? Because sometimes we, we, we can listen that, yes, yes, it's very interesting, but at the end, we see that it's very long process before that, uh, that end user really uh, ap appropriates this, this kind of information. I mean, on the, it's a very good question. On the emergency response, there is certain training and evangelization on how to use this. I mean, these maps or these um, products that you put in terms of early warnings are is, is very binary, alert, not alert. Um, it, it, it's open to interpretation, right? Um, I think the industry knows very well how to use this information. You know, one is put into their hands, they know what to do with it and how to get value out of it. But when you go into the humanitarian and emergency um, response, um, first it is a little bit on, how can I say this, on pushback. You know, like if we work a lot with wildfire and when you go to a firefighter and you tell them about you know, the potential risk, they are the ones they know about wildfire. So there is a little bit of pushback on using digital technologies that will tell you what is going to happen. And, and that is the truth. No? Um, even though it's pushed bottom, top bottom, you know, whoever is dealing with the risk um, always knows better because they are the ones. Dealing with it. But um, yeah, there is a little bit of work to be done there. And communicating how to use this information is, is as critical as providing the information. Okay. And Mario? Yeah, sure. And, and maybe working on training people for other, for other areas. Because for, for us, I, I'm pretty sure that the big companies uh, for wine producer knows and can use the inform this information right, right well, pretty well. But uh, for a simple grape grower, I, I'm not pretty sure that the, uh, they maybe don't know it, the, what the market app, apps can, can use or what kind of information are useful for trying to control or predict some risks or not. Uh, that's the reason why I say the, I'm talking about the public resources, about the, the ancient agency from the Ministry of Agriculture. But right now, some enterprises do, do the same kind of advice. But uh, sometimes the, the apps is not, uh, is not uh, how to say that, it's not fit. Uh, like uh, the, the real information needs from the agricultures and I think we need training and, uh, and of course, uh, and of course, uh, working on communication and transfer the, the knowledge from that. And of course, the wildfire also. I, I take only one note about the wildfires. I know that this is not the the worst effect of wildfire, of course, but it has to be taken that the, during the last year in Australia and New Zealand, the wines produced in 2020 has the smoke taint wine smoke at the nose and this really depreciated in testing world uh, championships. So this is uh, uh, other wording for us, <laughs> okay? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, and at the same time, I think that in, in the academy in the research centers that there is also a need for for, for these in, in interdisciplinary teams to facilitate the, the communication. So people with expertise in social science, in, in designing uh, tools, uh, communication. Yeah. And just a last question on my side, still about uncertainties, um, because uh, we understand from this morning that uh, subseasonal forecasting is still at the very beginning, so we can expect to have a lot of uncertainty. Um, but um, how to manage uncertainties, or what is the best choice not to use the subseasonal forecast because the product is not so mature and we need to have a more um, precise information or can we start to use subseasonal forecasts even if we have these difficulties and these uncertainties? Uh, how to manage the uncertainty here? Yeah. In... 
I'm the, the best to, to answer this, but uh, we, we, uh, let me explain an example. We, we have a collaboration with, with Decathlon, okay? because uh, Decathlon is selling different sports. And for instance, in, in winter, if, if we have a warm uh, winter, they cannot sell skis and these kind of things. And, and we, when we started the collaboration, I emphasized this point about um, the skill of the predictions, the uncertainty, everything. And for them, uh, and at some point they say, okay, be, relax, uh, no worries. We, we get the point, and, but for us, we, we don't need the perfect simulation, but we need at least a, an alert uh, several weeks in advance uh, to, to know that maybe something is happening because like that, we can reorganize our logistics. Okay, and, and this was... I don't remember. The, I think it, it was by, by the end of 2019 when, when we started the, col the, collaborator the collaboration and we had the Filomena event here in Spain and where yeah, everything was collapsed here in Spain and the Calong was selling all the, um, all the trekking material and everything because people cannot walk on, on the street. So it was a, a nice example because yeah, three weeks before the event, we started saying, okay, here there is a, a strange signal. And, and, and then we had this huge event, so. I, yeah. I think this is important that the sample Albert gets floor directly. Yeah, I, I think that this, if we, we can make a real situation, trying to solve real problems, maybe our models will be better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and I think to complement Albert's point, um, I, I always used to say that, you know, when you are in research, you work about, you worry about the second decimal, and when you go to industry, it's a factor of two. So it's, it's the big jump that you have to worry about um, when, when you need to understand your clients, and um, uncertainty comes in very different shapes and flavor. It's probably different something for um, the wine industry that it is for an insurance. So um, it's, it's, it's not so much about how we deal with uncertainties to define what uncertainty means for everyone and how does it affect that uncertainty to them. Because maybe, you know, like uh, the second decimal being wrong doesn't affect him or the alone and all they need qualitative alerts. But if you go um, to a, an insurer and you know that threshold, it can imply millions of euros of um, payout. So I think, I'm not sure if there is an answer to this, but there is also questions that they need to be resolved. For that. What might be answer? Okay. Thank you. I don't know if there is some question uh, here. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, well, I'm going to come back to Christina's point, and this is a bit sort of like cheating because I was talking to you, to you, you know, last week. And you have replied to her question that maybe people would be sort of like uh, the, the first requirement, no? if you were now sort of access to, to certain resources to actually introduce all this new knowledge, you know, and to, to deliver your products or services or change things that you would like in, in your company or the sectors you work for. And coming back to the communication question, uh, do you think, uh, obviously you need people with technical skills, with uh, critical thinking and an ability to compute, whatever we imagine, not uh, to go from this peer review papers, this graphics or this data to something that you could use. But do you think these people should also be able, for instance, to deliver this uncertainty, for instance, to customers? Do you think uh, communicating anything new is something important in, in a context in which you have to, to change maybe the way to, to proceed and to update, let's say? I'll take an attempt. Um, the, the truth is when you do the jump into industry and you try to communicate anything, and uncertainty being one of those things to the industry, you suffocate them. As a scientist, as a researcher, you tend to give too much information and the, the excess of information is that being a bad thing, you know? So I think um, the answer is no. I think we, we will prepare ourselves a little bit better to convey that information, simplify it and learn how, how that information needs to be actually explained to whoever is on the other side. And 
something that probably I would recommend my, to myself five years ago is take more or learn more about how to communicate science in general, you know, to the industry, because you tend to always go to what you know, which is the hardcore science. And like Albert was saying, they might want a green and red alert. So that being able to convey all your science into a green or red for us is, is way more difficult than explain you the numerical weather prediction model, right? So yeah, more training into how to communicate, um, not expecting that there will be a communication person. It's, it's needed from bottom up, from when you are in PhD all the way when you are in leading any sort of like commercial venture. I would maybe add to that, that it's um, maybe, uh, it's also sort of an um, yeah, economic decision. There is this famous saying, never change a running system. Hmm. And if, if new information would convince, maybe not everyone, but a good chunk of decision makers to change these processes, someone else has to make a decision to invest that the processes now follow a different structure, that systems that need to be set up in a different way. Yeah? Um, a big challenge or change for insurance industry was to switch from aggregated risk models to detailed risk models. Last month, I've heard that our underwriting units don't use the detailed risk models because they don't have the time to put the input data in the correct format so that they can use it. So if it already starts with these little details, and these are already the challenges that, that the industry faces, not even interpreting the results, but just working with data can all still be already an issue. And yeah, so I think it's not only convincing the people who are doing the work, but also convincing the management that they should now learn and do something new. And this, I think, is a psychological challenge more than it than a quantitative challenge. I, I fully agree with that. I, I said before that it's important to uh, invest in training and formation at the scientific and technical level from one side, but on the other hand, it's important too to improve our skills in communications, uh, mainly trying to translate to the own languages to the terminate sectors. And one, and one uh, good exercises, in my, my opinion, is trying to, to, to keep the scientific information to different sectors. And you will see this is not the same, the wine sector or the cereal sector or the, you know, this. In that way, you have to improve a lot your communication skills, trying to talk in their own languages of, of this one. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay. Hi. So I have a very, like, I think it's a very specific question because as scientists, most of the times when we deal with uh, uh, our work that, uh, you know, like, wants to be um, related and directed to the end users, we try to make the forecast. Uh, sort of deterministic, right? So like we have this um, multimodal ensembles that give a, gives out our, uh, like these probabilistic results, but in the end we have to say to the industry if the event will happen or not. So, and, and the forecast can be wrong in two ways. So it could be that the event actually um, happens and the forecast did not predict it. So, and this, we, we call it like a missed event, or like we, we have a false alarm instead when the forecast actually predicted an event and instead it doesn't happen. So I don't know like who actually can respond to this question, but what like do you think is worse, is more detrimental, is more dangerous for the industry? Like a false event case or a missed event, a false alarm case, sorry, or a missed event case? For insurance industry, it's clearly the missed event, really. I mean, none of these, uh, let's say, risk mitigation measures will cost us the same amount of money as a payout. If that would be the case, we would be relaxed because then we can just weather the payout, you know? But um, we are doing this to not be, to, I don't want to say to minimize the payout, but to minimize the impact that we have with the payout. So it's always the missed event that would be more difficult for us than the false positive. 
I think I can agree with that. I think the preventive measures are usually cheaper than corrective measures. So. Yeah, sorry. Ah, sorry. I, I think uh, I said that I agree with Jan. I think that preventive measures will be usually cheaper than corrective measures. And that is definitely true with certain sectors. You go to the emergency response and it's completely the other way around. So, right, so, so it, it, it's a little bit depends who you're responding and, and, and who's responding to to the aerial in this case, you no, know, for the insurance sector for sure. It's this way for other sectors. It's it's the other way around. The question. Yeah, one, yeah. Okay, two questions. Two. So uh, uh, thinking about what we need to improve in our prediction models, what, what would you in each sector say is the worst case scenario? So what is the perfect storm that uh, keeps you awake at night? That's a locked up information. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, we do have these, we call them budget scenarios. That simply means scenarios that couldn't break a company's neck. Yeah? And uh, they need to be managed as well. I mean, if you're a good risk manager, and that means you have to allocate capital, budget, that's the budget. And you have to have money on the side for these events. You have to be in a position that you can buy money, as silly as it sounds, if something like this happens. And of course, there's always some, let's say, design limit. You know, there's always some threshold and if it's beyond that then that's it and i think when it comes to example of storms or earthquakes i think everyone knows where these hot spots are yeah and uh if these events occur that will be challenging for the whole insurance sector and then there are of course are also events that have not been on the radar maybe enough so far and these are events i don't know this is a totally different topic maybe solar storms for instance that can knock out the power for not just a couple of days, but maybe even weeks to months. And what happens then? So the, these types of scenarios are, of course, scenarios, but they will shake not only the insurance industry, they will shake the whole economic sector, maybe in a similar way as the energy crisis does at the moment, or as COVID did a year ago. Yeah. So, um, but it's probably, um, to answer that question precisely, it's a procession, question where every company has its own as opinion. But I can tell you, they probably won't be willing to share it. I, I don't think that we'll be a bit challenging now, but um, I don't think the issue is with the modeling. I think there is a lot of good modeling that is still not being used in industry. Now, it takes a certain amount of time for the industry to be willing to even try that. So I'm sure that Munich Re, as uh, many other uh, other top names in the industry, they receive a hundred different ways of model wildfire. But you know, they might still continue going with RMS, even though they know that you know there is some flaws into that modeling because all never change a running system. Never change a running system and then you put me out of out of business. So that's 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 that that's the little bit of the issue. I think the science obviously can continue advancing and, and there are a lot of like gaps um, to be pushed, but I don't think we need to put the pressure on the science. We also need to put the pressure on the industry to, you know, be more open into, you know, changing the running system, even though, you know, it has worked for the last 10 years, because then if we go into the example of wildfires, this can be like the analogy you were saying for certain insurance in California, that almost put them out of business, you know, and now if you need to get some insurance for wildfires in California, you need to work three jobs. So the protection gap is going to continue being higher just because offers are not going to be on the table. No? And uh, if we go to, into middle or low middle income countries, that's, that's even worse. So it's, it's not only on science. I think science is doing a job, um, maybe transferring more from science to industry and, and doing that more efficiently is what we can ask um, from the science then. And, yeah, to continue on, on this question of knowledge transfer between 
science and, and the users. Um, do you have any recommendation on, from your experience how it works and how it could be improved? For example, Albert, you are working between the science and, and the users and how you manage to, to use very, very complicated information. When we, we listened at the presentations this morning, there are a lot of information, a lot of things to use, but how to, how to do that, how to... Yeah, in our case, it's um, because in, in our team, it, we are working people with different backgrounds and we work together. Um, so in, in our case, it's in-house, it's somehow already done. But for, for me, it's um, I, I think that the, the key point is that we need um, people in the middle. So like uh, SMEs that they, they they are faster when, when they see an opportunity to, so big companies that for, for them, it's difficult to, to change any protocol or anyway. But um, if an SME see, see an opportunity, they, they, they can uh, be more, more adaptable on, on this way. So trying to, to collaborate with uh, people out of your comfort zone, of, out of the academy working with, maybe not the final user because sometimes it's more difficult, but with SMEs that they are used to interact with the final user, yeah, I think that this is something important. Thank you. Yeah. I think there are two ways. There is the long way, and that is bring the scientists into the companies and wait five years until some of these heads find their way into the management. But do we have this time? Don't know. The other option is, of course, companies like yours they have to tell, tell convincing stories, not convincing for scientists, but convincing for the current management, for the people that had not necessarily have a scientific background, but just purely look at the economic numbers. Why is your product better? What, better? what does it mean for my balance sheet if I'm using your model compared to RMS model or other models? Now, these stories are told convincingly directly to the management or on the management niveau, which is not very deep, honestly. Uh, I think this, this can enhance or accelerate it, it might mean that you have to use a non-scientific language and brag a bit here and there that you're so and so much better than this and that. Don't do this to the scientists in the company. Do this whenever you speak to the management. <laughs> I fully agree. And another thing that we can do is try to discriminate some technologies or models depending on the sector that we, you can apply because sometimes there's a lot of offer of different technologies arriving from one sector and we need uh, this kind of enterprises or VSC in order to try to discriminate which is useful or not for um, determining situation. More, more of these tables at the end, the panel that you have put here, it answers that same question. You have the research centers that are more and more closer to industry through innovation projects that they don't state so much at low TRL, so they're going closer to industry. You have SMEs that are transferring that knowledge into the industry, and now ESC has almost 12 spin-offs, so this is something that is happening. And then finally, you have the industry attending to these kind of events, listening to what the new technology is out there, and believing, you know, that um, sometimes the status quo can be changed. So this, this is the combo, I think. Yeah, the chain is a complete chain to... Um, it doesn't reside in one, it's the combination everyone is. Okay, um, and just uh, to finish, because I think time is over, but um, about the co-design of information and the work with a multidisciplinary team, uh, did you experience this kind of work and what are the results? And yeah, I, I, because it's very important to, um, uh, to develop projects that fit with uh, the need of the end user, but also fit to what the science can, can answer. And then, yes, do you have experience in this co-design process that we listened this morning to, to that, that point, the importance to, to co-design and what is your experience? And yes, if you have some recommendation to improve the process of co-design. Design sprints to me, it starts with design sprints, the experience that we have had with AXA and Willis by sitting with them for two weeks, not selling them anything, you know, because there is always a pushback, you know, it's like, oh, we already have this or we're doing it better. 
but you know, sit down with them for a period of time and warm up so they can start selling what the limitations of the products that they have are, and then co-designing with them. We have done a co-design with Willis. We have done co-design with AXA. It's, it's great. And that's for us. A lot of startups, they feel that you know, their IP is going to be missed or they're going, to, you know, they're, doing, they're going to do it themselves. But if you try to sell them something, it's way more aggressive. If you work with them towards the solution, yeah, sure, you'll have less margin, but it will be definitely getting all the way to the person that needs to make that decision. So co-designs are great. Yeah. In my, for, for me, I, I think it's clear the, the one technology platform boosts R&D project with finally some of them finalizing product, market products, and with this, born from the collaboration between the industry and the academic partners. I think it's pretty much the, the same, a lot of say. The collaboration is better than that is selling something to the industry. I think it's already changing. I think if you turn back for the insurance industry first, I think if you turn back time 10, 20 years, uh, all the knowledge was bought, bought from um, external companies, maybe even from well, scientific corporations where no one really participated from the insurance side. Yeah? And I think this has changed gradually over the last 10 years. And now you already have some expertise, some deep, deep expertise in these companies as well. They can speak the same language. They understand the problems. And so I think the setup at the moment is, is, is pretty good for, 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 for this type of trend or development. And the question only is, uh, should it be accelerated? Does it just need some time to build up trust or to... It's, can, can it be accelerated? I, I don't know, it's, but I think it's all on the right track. Okay, I don't know if there are some questions. Uh, oh. yeah. I'll try to, to connect to what you're discussing now. My, my question was uh, touching some of the previous questions, and, and there was um, some discussion about um, you know, this tailoring that takes place. It can be tailoring. So you know, it can be the, the green and red that you were talking about uh, as a category forecast, or it can be the appetite for uncertainty. It can be uh, anything else. So th there is a gap between the producer of the, of the climate information and then the user. And I guess my question is, who's best position to fill that gap? Because for like you were talking about the aggregation on uh, geographical homogeneous scales, or there are many examples of those, and each one is specific. The appetite for um, cost benefit, you know, depending uh, misses or or false alarm depend on on, on your cost benefit somehow. So, so as a provider of climate information, I cannot address all the needs of, of the diverse community of users. So from your point of view, who should do that, that job? Who's, who's, who, whose job is that job? I think this, well, first of all, it's, it should be our own homework to do that, but we don't have time to do that. <laughs> so gratefully, there are companies like what you are representing here, these, I call it data agencies, these, these men in the middle between you know, they're all scientists, but they are not a scientific institution, so they can speak both languages. So I think that job needs to be done and is done by these type of companies, but our industry is just so slow and reluctant, and maybe even at the first moment a bit a skeptic and distrusting, so that it might take a while until we, you know, move in the right direction. But as I just said, I think we are already on the right track. And we you maybe as well need to be patient with this with this development. No? We we are uh, what is the word um, like growing this type of of of, of knowledge of, of expertise on our side incrementally. <laughs> I totally agree. I think that the, the vehicles are there. The issue is the time. Right, so how long would it take them to actually lose that untrust and how long would it take us to gain that as trust and in the middle don't die, no? So that, that is the, the challenge. I think, you know, the knowing who to put in the table is very relevant as well, no? You need to have the innovation group maybe from an institution like 
you know, agree with an SME and that conversation happens. Who's, who's meant to fill the gap? Probably both sides. But I think um, projects like this one, you know, like projects like where, you know, you can have um, ITNs and training networks and H2020 where you start bringing and reeling the industry into it so they feel a little more comfortable. They're starting to see this with their own eyes. Um, it's, it's, it's probably going to shorten that gap. You know? But I don't think the pressure should fall on one institution or one stakeholder. No, it's probably it needs to be from both, from both sides. You're definitely doing your side, putting data there for everyone to use it. Okay, thank you. I think it's time to, to close this with Timber. So I would like to thank you all the panelists for the very interesting uh, discussion today. And um, so thank you to, to you all for your presentation.